All right, good, good morning, everybody. For, for those that don't know me, my name's David Robinson, and I'm the branch head for the uh, Basin Systems branch here at Geoscience Australia, and it is my pleasure to convene the GA seminar this week. I'll begin by acknowledging uh, that we're meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people here at Geoscience Australia. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that are joining us here today. I'd also like to acknowledge that here at Geoscience Australia we work across all of our land and marine jurisdiction and I extend that respect to the First Nations people across all the lands we work on. And I acknowledge that many of you are joining us online from uh, different parts of Australia and indeed the world. And I pay my respects to the First Nations people from where you're joining us also. Today, I have the great pleasure to introduce Phil Commander. Uh, Phil has over 40 years experience as a hydrogeologist. He's very well known in the field. Uh, and comes with a, a, a lot of respect across the entire country. Uh, his presentation today, is, as you can see online, is around the diversity in uh, management of different groundwater systems. So groundwater systems range from large sedimentary basins to small alluvial aquifers, each with its own unique characteristics. And today, Phil will talk about some of those characteristics and in particular how information around that helps inform our management. I'll let him cover the details of the talk as he goes, but as I said before, Phil has over 40 years experience as a geologist and hydrogeologist, specialising in groundwater resource investigation and assessment. He has worked throughout Western Australia during his career with the Geological Survey and the Department of Water, including four years as regional hydrogeologist in the Pilbara. He has published widely on aspects of the hydrogeology of Western Australia and contributed to a range of national projects. He completed his Masters of Science on the hydrogeology of the Anaba area and has worked extensively on the hydrogeology of the Perth Basin. He has served on the National Water Commission's Groundwater Advisory Committee and the Department of Water Science Review Panel. He is a past president of the Australian chapter of the International Association of Hydrogeologists and has been an adjunct associate professor at the University of Western Australia and an adjunct senior lecturer at Curtin University. He is currently an independent hydrogeolo hydrogeological consultant and I'm sure you will agree with me that's a very impressive CV and I personally am greatly looking forward to hearing what Phil has to say about the subject. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Phil to the stage. Oh, thank you, David, for that in introduction. Um, this talk was, um, I was given free range for this talk. Um, and I remembered back to an occasion where, um, where, where colleagues in the department who were not hydrogeologists were really surprised um, going into a new area, the Southwest Yarragadee um, investigation that, oh, this is not like the Nangara Mound then. So people, uh, it, I realized that non-hydrogeologists didn't have the conception of the variety of groundwater systems. And that's, that's really why, what, what the basis of this talk is. Um, Australia is a pretty dry place, uh, especially the, the bit that I come from. So the red here shows where 90% 90, 90 of um, water supplies are from groundwater. So most of the western and central parts of Australia are totally reliant on groundwater, so it's really important. Groundwater has a real economic value for, for Australia. It um, supports uh, irrigation, stock water throughout the um, uh, interior areas, pretty essential for mining um, and supports urban households and industry and makes a huge contribution to our export um, and export industries. So what I'm going to look at today are characteristics of some groundwater systems and different systems, uh, looking at basins, um, alluvial aquifers, 
uh, paleo channel aquifers. Um, fractured rock I'm not really going to deal with at all. Uh, most of our res resources are from basins, alluvial aquifers, and paleo channels. A feature of Australian groundwater is the high salinity. So mo over all of, um, uh, particularly over southern, southern Australia, uh, we've got saline groundwater. So it's a challenge finding usable groundwater resources. Um, I thought we would run through just the difference between surface water and groundwater systems. S surface water can be mapped at the surface, you can see it, whereas geology has to be inferred from boreholes. So we never have 100% certainty as to what the, um, what the architecture is. The residence time for surface water is in days to months, whereas residence time in aquifers is up to millions of years. So quite different there. Surface water is generally fresh and uniform, but groundwater can be fresh to hypersaline and very variable locally. With surface water, you can measure the flow directly. Um, but with groundwater, and I won't use the word flow because that has connotations of bar, so I will change that to movement of groundwater has to be inferred from borehole measurements. Surface water is characterized by communal irrigation systems, whereas groundwater is generally self-supply systems, that is, back on the landowner um, or the company to supply their own systems. And a major difference between surface and groundwater is that all the surface water can be used. All the surface water you've got in a dam can be used, but we can only use a portion of the storage of groundwater. So what can we use um, in groundwater? We talk about sustainable yield. So this is a definition which state representatives came up with 25 years ago. The level of extraction measured over a specific planning time frame that should not be exceeded to protect the higher value social, environmental and economic uses associated with the aquifer. That may, means that Sustainable yield is not a technical quality, quantity. You can't calculate it. It's not a scientific quality, quantity. It is a value judgment of, of what you want to, what the impacts will be on the social, environmental, and economic um, environment. How do we um, allocate groundwater use? Um, obviously, I'm using Western Australian examples where um, we have management areas um, subdivided into uh, sub-areas sub and each one of those has an allocation limit. Now I like to tell people that an allocation limit is what you're comfortable in allocating to licensed use uh, with our present, with our current knowledge. Um, and this slide sort of shows the transition through time, time along the x-axis here, um, with licensed entitlements. Um, uh, so licensed entitlements increase through time, and in usage increases through time. And we would expect to go from a low level of hydrogeological knowledge, a low level of understanding um, at the beginning. Um, and as time progressed, we should be making investigations um, and putting in monitoring so that when we get to the um, when we get to the ultimate sustainable yield or allocation limit, uh, we are much more uh, confident uh, that we are we have got sustainability. Um, so, what are the impacts of groundwater withdrawals? That's what we're really interested in. Uh, we're not interested in the quantity so much that we're pumping. We're interested in what it's going to do to the environment. So pressure and water level reduction is the main thing. When you pump an aquifer, you're going to reduce the pressure, reduce the potentiometric head. The groundwater may be supporting wetlands and phreatophytic vegetation. So it uh, would be critical to uh, um, lower the water level and deprive wetlands and phreatophytic vegetation of, of their means of living. Uh, there may be a salinity increase associated with pumping water, especially if you're 
um, close, to the, close to the ocean or saline river. There may be other water quality changes as um, pumping, um, as you increase the uh, unsaturated zone, for instance. Uh, we may have resource depletion. Uh, obviously, you, use, you may be pumping from storage and your uh, resource is uh, being depleted. And subsidence may occur part by pumping confined aquifers. And we have to manage this in a, in a period of climate change. Uh, <clears throat> you don't know what the recharge is going to do. So this graph here shows the, um, the cumulative departure from mean rainfall in Perth from 1880 onwards. What it, says, what it means is during the period up to <coughs> 1910, there was slightly below average rainfall. From 1910 onwards, or 1917 onwards, during the 1920s and early 30s, it was very wet in Perth. Um, and that wet period continued on till the end of the 1960s. And since the 1960s, since 1970, we've been in a dry period. This only goes up to 2000. We've been even more dry in the last 20 years. So we've got this fluctuating climate um, that we have to deal with. And during this period of wet, wet period, that's when our vegetation has grown up and the lake levels, which were swamps in Victorian times, um, it, during this period, swamps turned to lakes in the 1920s and 30s and reached their highest level in the 1970s, just when we were using, uh, so this is Perth, just when we started to use shallow groundwater, um, we had a vegetation system used to having high rainfall and then we turned over to a, a dry period. So um, difficult to uh, predict. So there are a number of factors involved in determining allocation limits. We might have a groundwater model. Um, we should have some water level responses which tell us whether we're doing all right or not. We look at the rainfall train, um, environmental constraints, unlicensed use and public water supply and other factors too. Um, so what are the features of groundwater systems? Um, I mentioned uncertainty in geological interpretations and measurements. That's always with us. There's a great variation between sedimentary to fractured rock. Uh, we have a groundwater quality distribution, salinity, uh, which is quite variable. We would like to know through flow, recharge and discharge to enable us to understand the water balance. Uh, we can very rarely calculate those numbers. And uh, there are environmental dependencies on, on aquifers that we need to account for. So what I'm going to do is now look at a range of groundwater systems, um, compare and contrast. And most of these are West Australian ones because those are the ones I've worked with. So any discussion of Australian groundwater obviously begins with the Great Artesian Basin. It covers some 17% of the um, Australian continent. Uh, this very simplified schematic um, just illustrates that um, there's a peripheral recharge. We have a saucer-shaped basin here with peripheral recharge, uh, groundwater movement um, through uh, confined aquifers and discharging <coughs> at uh, springs at the outlet um, within the basin area. And for much of the basin area, the potentiometric head is higher than the surface, which means the bores put down to the deeper aquifers are going to free flow at the surface. So that is an enormous economic value um, placed on that. This map shows the recharge areas around the rim, essentially. Uh, groundwater movement across to discharge at these springs on the southern margin. And these springs are important. They have um, endemic uh, um, ecosystems, uh, unique, um, surrounded by desert. They're totally dependent on the springs. So a major management um, objective is to maintain the pressure, maintain the potentiometric head to keep those springs going and to um, and to maintain a head for flowing bores. So a big program was to cap off the 
our teas in bores and stop the waste of, of water. So we're not worried about sort of allocating storage here. We're worried about um, uh, maintaining head for, uh, for bores to flow and for springs to um, keep going. Uh, so moving across to the other side of the continent, um, the Carnarvon Basin, similar in some respects to the Great Artesian Basin, um, the flat area of uh, uh, coastal area, pastoral use, um, and it's supplied by artesian bores, free-flowing bores, uh, similar to the Great Artesian Basin. Uh, what is different about this is that um, the salinity is really high, um, it's stock water for most of the area, but some of the areas are getting um, even too saline for stock. Um, it does supply um, coastal communities, Denham, Useless Loop, Coral Bay, are supplied from the Birdrong Sandstone, which is the only aquifer there, but it's desalination. It's 15,000 or so milligrams per litre, half seawater, by the time it gets to the coast. So a management objective for the Carnarvon Basin, similar to the Great Artesian Basin, is the maintenance of head. And we've done age dating in the, or tried to do age dating in the um, areas that we thought were recharge areas. We've got, we weren't able to find any modern water and even close to the recharge areas, we've got very old water of um, tens of thousands of years. So we don't have to worry about recharge because it doesn't look like there's any so con contrasting with the big artesian systems um, are alluvial systems. The Gascoigne River here uh, flows into Carnarvon across the Carnarvon Basin. Normally the Gascoigne River is completely dry. It has a large uh, extensive sandy bed. Occasionally it floods. This is Carnarvon plantations here. There's um, generally use the use of um, 10 gigalitres of uh, water for the plantations here, and it produces $100 uh, million dollars worth of agricultural produce. The river doesn't often flood like this, because obviously that's a bit of a disaster. But when the river flows, um, it fills up the river riverbed sand, um, which can then be used uh, by the plantations along the river. And in this case, it's allowable to use the total storage of the um, aquifer of the riverbed sand. Um, there is a trigger of uh, salinity monitoring to ensure that salinity doesn't come, up, come upstream from the uh, coast um, to uh, ensure, that, um, ensure that fresher quality, ensure that saline water doesn't intrude into the, into the aquifer and the, the older alluvium beneath. Um, and when the, when the storage runs out for self-supply for these growers along the river who've got their own bores or pumps, uh, there's a, a, um, uh, a public scheme they can buy water of from a bore field further up the, um, further up the gas coin. So that's a case where total storage can be used on the basis that it's going to flow every year or occasionally miss a year. Coming south now to the uh, Nangara Mound, uh, which is uh, um, just north of Perth. It's Perth's uh, main water resource. The Nangara Mound is um, a coastal plain sediments of 70 metres or so thick of sand uh, uh, in a mound shaped here. It re receives direct recharge from rainfall. Uh, groundwater moves um, westwards to um, discharge at the ocean um, and it supports it supports lakes wetlands uh, and supports wetlands here uh, and supports a banksia woodland um, over the sandy uh, soils and some of these um, trees have been shown to be phreatophytic uh, because they've died in the uh, Kona depression of pumping bores um, and we often have no way of telling which trees are phreatophytic and which ones are not. The Nangara Mound, of course, has got a lot of competing land uses on it. 
um, from market gardens, uh, urban urbanization, uh, pine forests, and a major um, the major um, constraint or impact of use is likely on the wetlands and um, and and the native vegetation. Uh, so that's the um, the management objectives of that, as well as managing it for public water supply. As I mentioned before, the um, lake levels and water table was highest uh, in the Nangara Mound in about 1970. That's when the pl pine plantations were put in. Um, and in the intervening years, they've basically soaked up the recharge and withdrawn water from the water table. So pines are basically being cleared off the aquifer to allow uh, a greater recharge. But this is in the context of declining rainfall. Um, this graph shows the um, inflow to Perth Hills dams. Okay, so it's not, nothing to do with groundwater, but it does actually show a surrogate as to what you might expect the groundwater recharge to be. So in the past, we've had these really high rainfall years, uh, which, which would have provided um, groundwater recharge, but now the uh, runoff is, is very small um, and likelihood of groundwater recharge is um, also diminished. And this is a typical um, graph of water level on the Nangara Mound um, declining. Um, this is a five meter decline over 30 years. Um, this is on the crest of the mound where there aren't any wetlands, but similar uh, trends are happening around the wetlands too. So moving down to the southwest coastal groundwater area just south of Perth, uh, this is an irrigation area. Um, it's a shallow aquifer, shallow limestone superficial aquifer, about 25 meters thick. Uh, there's fresh water in it. Got nice um, soils on here suitable for irrigation. Um, groundwater moves westwards, discharges in Lake Preston, which is a salt lake uh, with a salt lake interface. When they first started off irrigating during the 1970s, they put their bores in the middle of the crop. And it wasn't long before the salinity rose um, to a point where they couldn't irrigate carrots and um, sensitive uh, vegetables. Uh, so we bought them some time by recommending that they put their bores upstream of the crop. Uh, to make sure the plume of salt water or saline brackish water um, moves away from their, their borehole. Um, so in this case, management's not really concerned about water level reduction. Um, it's a very transmissive aquifer and the water level actually doesn't change very much. The major impact of, of pumping here or the major impact of use of the water is the salinity rise. So the preoccupation with monitoring in the southwest coastal irrigation area is monitoring salinity um, and restricting use um, on, on that basis. Moving southwards again to the almost to the south coast, the um, Blackwood Plateau, um, which is that southern area, here's Bunbury here, 200 kilometers south of Perth, uh, the Blackwood Plateau here conceals a major aquifer, the Yarragadee, which is a uh, Jurassic sandstone. We've got something like um, 2,000 meters of Yarragadee aquifer here, coarse sands, uh, with low salinity water in 200 milligrams per litre. The state's deepest water bore, uh, water exploration bore, is 1,600 meters deep, Carradale 7, and we're still in fresh water at the bottom. So enormous storage here. When there was proposals back in the 1990s to pipe water from the Kimberley, um, we basically put out the story. This was 60 Lake Argyles worth under the ground that we could use. In 2003, the Water Corporation decided that they would like to put a bore field in there to get 45 gilitres for Perth uh, because of the decrease in um, runoff into the hills dams. 
So a, an investigation was carried out on that basis to, to uh, prove up a, a resource. What we found was that um, the Blackwood River here, which goes back into the wheat belt, had cut through into the Yarragadee, and there was local discharge of Yarragadee into the Blackwood River. The Blackwood River is a bit strange in that it runs saline during the winter, where it gets run off from the wheat belt, and in the summer it goes fresh because of the discharge from the um, Yarragadee. And the constraining factor here is that there are a couple of tributaries which are supplied by spring discharge from the aquifer, um, support uh, fish which don't live anywhere else and which use the fresh streams as a refugia in winter when the river goes saline. So a major constraint on use of this aquifer are these fish and the small streams and basically we can't use the storage so it's been sitting there for the last 20 years and not being used um, and it basically hard to understand how we could take advantage of all that storage of fresh water uh, without um, disrupting the ecology so there's a major constraint contrasting with that in the northern Perth basin we have deep water tables. The water table's up to 150 meters deep. It doesn't um, very seldom does it come near the surface. It does in the Hill River area. It's about the only place where there's spring discharge from the, from the aquifer. Uh, so there are not really any great constraints um, on its use. One feature of that area is the, um, is the land use. So this graph shows the rise in water table after clearing. So clearing was mostly in the 60s and 70s, and as a result, water levels rose substantially, or are still rising uh, substantially. So this is eight meter rise since clearing in um, 30 years. The management here is, is also a prisoner of what agriculture does. So in terms of clearing the land for pasture and cereal crops, uh, there's been an enormous increase in recharge. Conversely, in some areas where they planted tagasasti, perennial crops, which, you, which are high water using, um, then the water levels um, are actually going down. And my last example is um, looking at Kalgoorlie, the um, Uh, Kalgoorlie is the center of gold mining. Um, it um, lies in a very semi-arid area. Uh, what is characterized by the, um, these paleo, paleo valleys uh, which head down to the Eucla Basin. Um, otherwise, uh, the um, local bedrock is granite, greenstone, uh, without major groundwater resources. Uh, the only groundwater available is basically in these paleo channels, um, which are under, underlay, which underlie chains of salt lakes in those um, paleo valleys, um, and these contain highly saline water, up to the six times the salinity of seawater. Typical bore field here for um, a gold mine. Uh, you can see a bores put down the paleo valley, paleo channel. Um, producing uh, salt water which can be used for treating gold. And here's the um, situation around Kalgoorlie with a number of bore fuels here. This is a little bit out of date, of course, um, but most of the paleo channels um, in the mining areas uh, are being pumped for, um, for salt water. What we're concerned here is, that, so this salt water, saline water there, it's probably taken hundreds of thousands of years to accumulate. The paleo channels are full with water, so they can't take recharge, they reject recharge. Um, and so management, uh, and there's no um, environmental um, dependencies of this hypersaline water. Uh, so the only, um, so the major factor here in allocating water is the storage. Um, and provided that um, 
the storage of water is outlives the, uh, the reserves of water outlive gold reserves, um, then uh, we, we have achieved sort of sustainability over a planning time frame. So we allow storage to be used here. In fact, our initial um, appreciation of storage has been very conservative and the bore fields have performed much better than uh, they thought they were. So not only are there great variations between different groundwater um, systems, um, we have uh, variations across smaller areas, groundwater management areas. When we set an allocation limit for um, a, a groundwater sub-area, we don't necessarily know where the bores are going to be kept because these are are going to be sunk because they're um, uh, self-supply. So we may have a concentration of use here, whereas we would uh, have, might have set an allocation limit on the basis that it would be more distributed. So that's one thing that's not under control. Um, trading has been brought into a lot of um, groundwater areas um, from the National Water Initiative's um, uh, directives. We may be uncomfortable in um, trading water from an area that's not being used very much into an area of concentration of use. We may be uncomfortable in allowing trading to close to a wetland because what we're really doing in our licensing is not licensing a quantity, we're licensing an impact. And the impact of um, Pumping water in this area, for instance, is different from uh, pumping the same quantity of water uh, near a wetland. So we have to take that into account. Um, it's not necessarily like for like. Uh, trading surface water, um, it's the same water that you're trading. Whereas if you're trading groundwater from one place to another location, um, there may be a total difference in salinity. Back to our southwest coastal irrigation area um, example, we, um, <clears throat> we may have compromised the uh, salinity in a place um, where the salinity has risen due to pumping and recirculation. Do we allow trading for um, trading out of that area where it's now useless uh, to an area where it's um, um, where it hasn't been used. So you're not trading like for like there. We're uncertain in some areas of the um, confined aquifers. Uh, we often don't know the um, correlation boundaries, so it happens that we can allocate groundwater licenses to the wrong aquifer, um, which is embarrassing if they um, happen to then have to be changed and be um, be thought to be over allocated. Monitoring, groundwater monitoring, of course, is the essential part of management. For any resource, you need to monitor the resource condition. And so groundwater monitoring is, is the key to um, sustainability. In Perth, we've got a whole network of um, superficial monitoring bores. Um, each one has their own little story. So each one of these um, graphs as an individual story depending on local pumping, local land use changes, local recharge. The confined aquifer bores here, also a big network of um, uh, confined aquifers down to uh, 800 metres or so, some of these bores. Um, now we've got, um, in Perth, 50 years of records on these bores, so we've um, got a lot of confidence in how understanding how the um, confined aquifers are, uh, are performing. An aspect of management too is uh, close to the coast. Uh, we would have a saltwater interface um, and need to monitor changes in the saltwater interface um, so that it doesn't move in and compromise uh, groundwater quality. Pumping confined aquifers um, essentially means you're pumping from elastic storage so that um, the aquifer uh, matrix is going to um, com compress 
um, and the land surface uh, may sink. Uh, these headlines in the paper were uh, to do with um, an interpretation from INSAR radar uh, measurements, um, which didn't bear any relationship to groundwater. Um, so really, we couldn't see that that was, um, it wasn't field checked. Um, but there is a real, um, a real measurement of uh, land subsidence. Fortunately, um, just serendipitously, the um, Geoscience Australia have a geodetic man um, measurement station at the Hillary's Marina uh, in Perth by the tide gauge. And this graph here shows the Yarragadi water levels, which took a dive um, in around 1990 with um, increased production from the confined aquifers. Um, and this decline here of 40 meters here coincides with a decline in the land surface of 40 millimeters. Um, so we do actually measure a very small amount of uh, groundwater uh, subsidence. That, of course, is being reversed now. The Water Corporation have a, um, have a program to uh, treat wastewater with um, reverse osmosis and re-inject it down into the um, Leederville Aquifer and the Yarragadee Aquifer. So those groundwater pressures are going to be um, going to increase. There are other aspects of um, other uses for um, groundwater in um, uh, deep groundwater in Perth. We have 16 or so bore, uh, geothermal bores, heating swimming pools. This is the St Hilda's bore here, which is the deepest one, down a thousand meters, getting water of 48 degrees centigrade um, and re-injecting, taking the heat out of it and re-injecting the water higher up into the Aragadi. Uh, so to conclude that, I'll wrap that up a little bit early. Um, what I hope to have shown is that there's a variety of groundwater systems and they're all different. They all have different characteristics and they all have different um, impacts. The impacts of pumping really determine the sustainable yield. We have to make a value judgment of what impacts are, what level of impact is acceptable. We're not really concerned too much with groundwater storage and there's a whole lot of groundwater in the ground that we can't use because of environmental constraints. And for, for managing the, um, any aquifer, we need to have adequate investigation and knowledge about that um, and essential monitoring through time, monitoring of water levels, uh, maybe salinity. Um, to monitor the resource condition. So going forward, that's my plea that you never know enough um, and it's necessary to carry on with investigations. Thank you.